All right, wonderful. So my name is Alex Miller. I will be your moderator this evening. Um, in my day job, I work alongside Simon, who you'll hear a little bit more from shortly, as a sustainability officer at Rethink Green. On the call tonight, we have some local and familiar faces, so including other speakers, plus uh, co-organizers and sponsors for this series, um, representing Next Economy North Bay. Uh, we're delighted to have you join us this evening and hope that you'll also be able to attend our other presentations over the next few weeks, which you can see on the screen here. Um, uh, next week, we'll be hearing from Brene Lloyd, project coordinator at Northwatch, who will be giving her presentation called Transportation Options, Sustainability and Social Connections. If you're interested in attending, please be sure to register on Eventbrite and join us again on Zoom. I'll be posting that link in the chat momentarily. Just uh, some housekeeping matters before we get going. Uh, I'd like to remind everyone to remain muted throughout the presentation today, uh, though you may feel free to keep your cameras on uh, because it's always great to see faces in a Zoom room. Um, if you have any questions, please make note as we go along and uh, we will allow time for a question and answer session uh, at the end of each presentation and we encourage your participation for sure. Uh, if you can either raise your hand to signal that you'd like to ask a question in person or you can place your question in the chat, whatever you're comfortable with. Uh, our speakers will also be pulling together some resources which we can circulate and together with the presentations and contact information in the days following each presentation. So if you want to follow up with anyone, you'll get that opportunity. Before we dive in, I'd like to acknowledge the Robinson Huron Treaty of 1850 and the land on which we are gathering on today, commonly known as North Bay. And it's situated in traditional Anishinaabek territory on lands occupied by the peoples of Nipissing and Duckies First Nation. I'd like to acknowledge how grateful we are for the opportunity to gather today and thank all the generations of people who have been stewards of these lands. We recognize and deeply appreciate this, their historic connection to this place. Uh, we also recognize the contributions which Métis, Inuit, and other Indigenous peoples have made, both in shaping and strengthening this community in particular in our province and across the country as a whole. As settlers, uh, this recognition of the contributions and historic importance of Indigenous peoples must be clearly connected to our collective commitment to deliver on the promise and the challenge of truth and reconciliation in our communities. Uh, gathering remotely via Zoom also means that we get to connect with people from all across Turtle Island, which means our land acknowledgements often need to stretch beyond North Bay itself. Uh, so if you're comfortable uh, and you're joining us from, from afar today, uh, please, I encourage you to share where you're coming from in the chat. I also wanted to offer you another resource to help us all take our land acknowledgements beyond routine statements about truth and reconciliation. Uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was formed as a means of reckoning with the devastating legacy of the residential school system. In, from 2008, to 2014, the commission heard stories from thousands of residential school survivors. In 2015, it released a report that included its call to action, um, instructions to guide governments, communities, and faith groups down the road to reconciliation. Uh, CBC's Beyond 94 is an interactive website that monitors the progress of that journey. Uh, it was created by CBC's Indigenous Unit, um, and it allows participants to track those outcomes and learn more about the residential schools that operated near their communities um, by exploring an interactive map uh, and also discover concrete examples of how indigenous and non-indigenous Canadians can work together. Uh, the project is a living resource as new documentaries, residential school survivor stories, ideas and community-based action around reconciliation are added. I encourage you all to take a look, um, stay informed and remain mindful of the various ways that you your community and your local decision makers can contribute to completing these calls to action. So I'm now gonna give a brief uh, overview of what we'll be covering today. First, we'll have Simon Blakely give us a brief introduction to Next Economy North Bay, um, hosts of this speaker series, and also Rethink Green, a Northern Ontario-based environmental programs incubator, which enables events such as this to take place. Uh, next, we'll have Rod Bills take the stage uh, the president of Remedy of Developments and a North Bay celebrity uh, will deliver a presentation called The Missing Small Developer, A Strong Town's Approach. Uh, following his presentation, we'll open for the floor for a brief Q&A uh, where you can feel free to ask Rod any questions that might come up throughout the session. 
And with that, I'll hand it over to Simon. Uh, take it away, Simon. Okay, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you, Alex, uh, and welcome to this, our second uh, virtual speaker series of 20, second of our virtual speaking series of 2022. For those of you who did not attend last week, I'll provide an overview as to our work so far. Founded in early 2019, Next Economy North Bay comprises a grassroots collective of local business and community leaders who are seeking to build capacity so the city of North Bay and surrounding communities may become leaders in the modern low carbon economy. It aims to provide a local, reputable and publicly accessible body of knowledge, which acknowledges the existence of climate change, at the same time as showcasing some of the many ways our community, businesses and households can transition to a cleaner, greener and more equ equitable economy. So to briefly touch on our relationship with uh, Rethink Green, which actually dates back to 2019, um, it's an environmental programs incubator that offers a variety of programs and services. which aim to bring together ideas, partners, and resources to build sustainable communities in Northeastern Ontario. So by creating community networks, which promote creative collaboration and dialogue about local and global issues, Rethink Green empowers its member organizations and partners to meet their environmental and sustainability goals. The organization also provides logist logistical support to support the development of grassroots initiatives such as Next Economy North Bay and the organization and delivery of public facing events such as this, which help us to increase awareness and build our own capacity to act on climate change here in North Bay. And in addition, over the past two to three years, as our relationship strengthened, I joined Rethink Green as its program director in April 2020, where I now oversee the Green Economy North and Smart Green Communities programs. So because today's session is all about the role of good land use planning and climate action, I wanted to set the tone for our conversation by introducing you to Rethink Green's low carbon retrofit project. In an effort to kickstart Great Sudbury's green, green build, building engine, Rethink Green set off on our own journey to explore options to convert an existing vacant property in central Sudbury and retrofit it as a net zero energy building. The mission of this project was to lead by example and make this space a place for environmental sustainability champions to gather while supporting efforts to develop skills and expertise to help Northern Ontario move towards a low carbon future. We were looking for properties uh, for ourselves, but also uh, remain open to partnerships and would like this to be a learning opportunity for everyone involved in the design process to contractors, for its suppliers and end users of the building. And in advancing the project, it was really important for us to understand the existing and potential future needs of our members and the community at large. And the study resulted in a detailed analysis of different locations, building types, and options to achieve energy efficiency gains, but also reduce our costs. If you're wondering what that might look like, um, it's, uh, and some other examples in Canada that we drew inspiration from, such as uh, Valet's uh, Living with Lake Centre over in Sudbury, which was a lead uh, leadership in an energy and environmental design certified global centre of excellence, and also the Ecology Action Centre over in Halifax, Nova Scotia, which features eco-renovated century old office space. So Alex will share some links to those different projects. So what were the outcomes of the study? As you can see from the graphic here, 88% of respondents felt that it was important that we, as an organisation, um, seek to become certified in some way whether it be a third party program like LEED or a zero carbon building. Our members and the community groups that we serve are also typically looking to um, obtain and access small and flexible spaces where they can convene to meet and host events. And something that was most telling was 53% uh, of the respondents indicated they would be interested in renting space that is more environmentally friendly. Uh, so this does suggest that there is a demand for greener buildings. It may not be an issue, uh, however, that business and property owners would um, like those spaces uh, to be delivered at an affordable and reasonable cost in their investment. 
So for those uh, interested to learn more, the final report summarizes what we believe are the key conditions for success in producing a green building and the recommended next steps. That report can be found on our website at www.vthinkgreen.ca. So we do find ourselves at a crossroads now in this project, and it's exciting to be developing and drafting some ideas and proposals for a potential new space to meet our needs into the future. And so wherever we do land, surely will require a collaborative effort um, with uh, seeking interest on behalf of building owners, property managers, investors, and sponsors. And we'd also want to help others achieve their goals. So if you have any potential leads or ideas for a project that you'd like to discuss, and please do reach out and you can see my email at the top of the screen. And with that, I'll hand it back to Alex. Unmute, there we go. Thank you, Simon. Um, some of you may still be questioning, you know, what is the value of retrofitting older properties? Um, with utility bills increasing and future generations calling for solutions to avert the worst effects of our climate crisis, those who can afford it really should be questioning when and how uh, will we take action. And looking to other communities and what they're doing, it's pertinent to note that uh, the city of Greater Sudbury uh, did opt to declare a climate emergency on the 28th of May in 2019. By acknowledging the problem, the city was able to harness a new political reality and start to envisage a new, a, a net zero future. And this was not a small feat. And as Kylie Ann explained in her presentation last week, are the co-benefits of community climate action, forming a robust plan and securing both stakeholder and community buy-in can be a lengthy but highly rewarding process. Um, and in the case of Sudbury, they now have, they've proceeded to develop a community energy and emissions plan uh, or SEEP as it's known. Uh, which identifies a series of community-led efforts which will be essential if the city is to meet its own target of becoming a net zero emissions community by 2050. Uh, in fact, uh, the goal number three of sustainability of Sudbury's uh, community energy and emissions plan specifically states the need to ensure existing building stocks in the city are retrofitted for a 50% increase in energy efficiency by 2040. So Sudbury is now working on an implementation plan uh, to help it achieve that goal. But what about the city of North Bay, right? The, in its latest energy conservation and demand management plan in 2019, the city of North Bay committed to reducing electricity from the grid by 2.5% per, per, per year, uh, reducing the use of traditional transportation fuels by 4% per year, and realizing a 3% reduction of CO2 emission gases annually. There have been considerable efforts on behalf of community partners to deliver what we refer to as environmental stewardship initiatives. So for things like litter collection, tree planting, water conservation, and drinking water source protection, et cetera, et cetera. But in regard to achieving a transition to a net zero or low carbon future, it's fair to say that there's still a considerable way to go. The city of North Bay has yet to declare a climate emergency uh, one of the only communities in Canada which has declined to do so. And we certainly would love to see similar actions taken to create an action plan and set more ambitious targets which support our community's resilience in the longer term. Um, a huge portion of that, of those efforts will ultimately require a combination of low impact natural solutions, building retrofits like the one Simon mentioned, and also smarter land use planning, all of which would provide a variety of co-benefits as Kylie Ann mentioned. Um, a quick side note, if you missed it, uh, I, you can watch it on YouTube and I'm gonna share the link in the chat too. Once Rod starts, I'll send you all these links. Um, and to summarize, there is some really important work going on behind the scenes. And what remains key is reimagining what our buildings and public spaces might look like how they might function and how we might get to and from them and how energy efficient they can be, uh, which is why I'm absolutely thrilled to welcome Rod Bills to speak with us today. Uh, Rod Bills recently retired after 40 years in the environmental field, holding positions in both the public and private sector. He founded FRI um, Ecological Services Inc. in 1996 and continues to provide an advisory role by conducting environmental impact studies for a range of development projects 
from simple municipal severances to complex provincial transportation studies. Rod incorporated Remedy Developments Inc. in 2019. Uh, the initial vision for Remedy Developments as a small developer was to transform community assets. They look for buildings and properties that are underperforming or are underutilized and develop them to become valuable community assets. And they created a transformation index that evaluates potential projects through 15 asset principles under the broad headings of location, community, and economics. A project must have the ability to truly transform the asset before they move ahead with it. Uh, so Rod held uh, several volunteer posts, including as chair of the Active Transportation Advisory Committees for the City of North Bay and the e Township of East Ferris. And he is a longstanding board member of the Discovery Routes Trails Organization and has completed several international volunteer advisory projects with the Canadian Executive Services Organization. He's one of the founding members of Next Economy North Bay and is passionate about creating the environment uh, for implementing the green economy. In his presentation, The Missing Small Developer and Strong Towns Approach, which we're about to hear, Rod will focus on the contribution that land use planning plays and how a clear vision of achieving sustainability goes hand in hand with the green economy. So over to you, Rod. I'm gonna stop sharing and you should be able to share your screen as well. All right, well, thanks very much, Alex, and Simon as well um, for setting this up and, and giving me the opportunity to talk today. Uh, first of all, is everybody good with seeing the screen? Looks good, Rod. Okay, good. <laughs> then we'll move ahead. Um, so yeah, so I wanted to talk a little bit uh, tonight about the role that um, land use planning plays in uh, climate change or combating climate change. And uh, this presentation really focuses on the principles and experiences of Strong Towns, uh, which is an organization that I follow really closely and uh, has a wealth of resources about smart urban planning um, and other agencies such as the Incremental Development Alliance and uh, Urban3 are also contributed uh, to materials in this presentation. Um, the small developer that acquires an underperforming property and transforms it into a valuable asset um, really has kind of disappeared from the landscape and the, and the majority of development that occurs in places like North Bay uh, is often done by larger developers and they're, they're typically looking for green lands that have not been previously developed. Um, so it's it, that, that type of developer is more or less disappeared from the landscape to a certain extent. So I want to talk about the swarm. <laughs> so this is really the period from the late 1800s up until probably the Great Depression when we saw a swarm of small scale developers basically creating new cities. Uh, we were a new country and as it slowly opened up, um, North Bay was similar to other cities that located along a rail line and when first people uh, when the first people started to settle here um, they quickly built small homes and businesses along a main street because that was the quickest and easiest arrangement um, failed businesses uh, transformed into another um, small buildings were added on and second levels were were constructed and the entire ecosystem was really a, a, a process of trial and error to see what works and to learn from those experiences there was very little risk for a small investment. And uh, then we could quickly test uh, a business opportunity and see if it works and if it works, expand on it. If it doesn't work quickly, uh, um, rebound from that. But with the advent of the automobile, that entire concept was tossed to the curb in place of large scale suburbanization where you drive to everything. So what does this have to do with climate change? Um, so we're, we're used to hearing about emission reduction and stuff like that, but what does land use planning really have to do with climate change? So those original communities were built to be walkable and they were built at a human scale. They were built without the benefit of any highly ordered land use planning processes. And they were constructed in a way that housing, employment, recreational areas were all in close proximity. They did this not knowing that this efficient way of creating a city was going to be ignored for decades in favor of suburbia. The reality is that these densely packed communities that were developed at a human scale 
also contribute to reducing our carbon footprint. That wasn't the original intent, but it certainly is the, uh, the result. So I'm gonna break up my talk into a few short videos as well, because um, some of these organizations that I mentioned have done some really good work um, and uh, visually it's easier to understand some of these concepts. Um, this first video documents the stance that the city of Montreal took on sustainability and public spaces. Um, I didn't mean to make this very much about Montreal, but it just turns out that there's a lot of really interesting and good things that are happening in that city. Uh, especially for such a large city. So this video kind of talks about how uh, public spaces have become important in Montreal and how they've taken a strong stance on, on climate change. Due to how the city's public spaces are designed. According to the Project for Public Space... Sorry about that. I'm going to just start from the beginning. <laughs> There's a reason why you don't need a backyard in Montreal. It's because you have this. There's a quote that I love by the urban designer and architect Jan Gell. He said that a good city is like a good party. People stay longer than is really necessary because they are enjoying themselves. And that's really the only way to describe Montreal. It's a good party. And when I say a party, I don't really mean a rager. I mean that the city feels alive. And that is in large part due to how the city's public spaces are designed. According to the Project for Public Spaces, there are four criteria on how to measure a successful place. The first being access and linkages which ties back to what makes a good party, because a good party is one you can get to without driving. Thankfully, Montreal's parks and public spaces are really well connected by bike and walking paths. The city boasts about 876 kilometers of bike paths. Every year, the Copenhagenized Index ranks the most bike-friendly cities in the world, and Montreal ranks in the top 20. Another criteria for a successful place is comfort and image. Montreal is actually considered one of Canada's greenest cities. In 2017, Valerie Plant was elected Montreal's mayor. Shortly after her election, Plant released a new climate plan, the Climate Plan 2020 to 2030. The Climate Plan basically lays out a number of key actions that will help Montreal become carbon neutral by 2050. But one of the big ticket items is that in the next decade, Montreal's committed to planting 500,000 trees. Tree canopies integrated into public space is essential in cooling a city. Urban heat islands refer to pockets of heat trapped between paved surfaces and densely packed buildings. The urban heat island effect essentially turns a city into an oven that continues to cook even after the sun has gone down. It's clear why the objectives of the climate plan must be met. Montreal's projections for 2071 are grim. By 2071, there will be a projected 74 days a year that are over 30 degrees Celsius. I know that climate projections can often feel really abstract, especially for those of us living in Southern Canada, where we feel largely removed from the effects of climate change. But Montreal is already experiencing hotter summers. It's currently like 38 degrees with a humid X. In 2010, Montreal experienced a deadly heat wave and 103 people died. Many of those people who died were in their 70s. By 2071, I'll be in my 70s. It's critical that municipalities make urban planning decisions that will mitigate the effects of urban heat islands, like planting more trees. But in places where you can't really plant trees, there's still a way to repopulate otherwise uninhabitable space. Transforming underpasses into skate parks isn't a new concept. Underpasses provide a sheltered place for people of all ages to gather. This ties into our third and fourth criteria for a successful place. How would you pronounce that word? Sociability. Sociability, thank you. What were you saying? Sociability. Sociability. Yeah. Sociability. Sociability and use and activity. And to see a perfect example of a mixed demographic using public space here in Montreal, we're going to have to hit up Jean Mons. On any given night, Jean Mons Park is packed with all types of gatherings, from smaller informal groups, couples picnicking and children playing, to larger organized events, university students partying around open fire pit grills, and volleyball clubs competing in the park's sand courts. Montreal's human scale turns the city into an all-hours party. The city's abundant public space becomes an extension of your own front step or terrace. People really do stay in public space for longer than is necessary, not because they have to, but because they're enjoying themselves. I hope you enjoyed this video. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and you can also find me on Instagram at Sampe, S-A-M-P-H-E. Also, I just started- Okay, so <clears throat> if anybody that's been to Montreal and has experienced what it's like, 
um, they really, really make use of uh, public spaces. There's many, many streets uh, that are pedestrian only streets in, in uh, the city of Montreal. There's all kinds of outdoor space that's available and connected uh, easily by bike trails um, and uh, transit and so on. So it's really an interesting place to go. So I wanna talk a little bit about something that we hear often and maybe some people know about and others may not, and that's the missing middle. And what does that actually mean? So the missing middle is housing that fits sort of between the traditional uh, detached single family dwellings and high rise apartments. Um, adding that missing middle to the portfolio of housing options can really significantly increase density in a city. Um, and that provides a, a greater range of housing options available to people as well. So operating a city is all about using your finite land space to its best potential. I think that's something that often gets lost. We have a finite land base. We're trying to maximize the use of it and making sure that we use those parts of uh, that land base to their maximum potential. I'm not saying that we should do away with detached single family homes, but they should not automatically be the default, default housing option that we consider. So I guess some people are concerned that do we accept greater density at the expense of the character of the place that we live in? Um, we've all been conditioned to think that detached single family homes are the defining character of a city. The reality is that we may all want that extra space and privacy, but selecting suitable housing is always a trade-off. Um, all that extra space comes at a cost and to live in the suburbs, you give up the convenience of having amenities within walking distance. And some people will still choose suburbia regardless of those, those things, and that's fine. Um, but we should not be limiting our housing options simply because that is what most people prefer if cost was no issue. And clearly cost is an issue when it comes to housing. This next little video really takes a look, a closer look at that missing middle type housing. And again, I'm sorry, it's in Montreal again, um, but it, the, the missing middle housing is really prevalent in most cities uh, that's dominated by detached single family homes. But Montreal is a bit of an anomaly again, uh, whereby most of the, the housing that was constructed during that same period that I was talking about, uh, the late 1800s uh, up to the Great Depression, it was not detached single family homes like most other cities in Canada, uh, but rather an interesting mix of duplexes, uh, three-story walk-ups and townhomes. So this particular video talks actually about five different neighborhoods in Montreal. Um, we're not gonna listen to them all because they're all very similar, but we will listen to just the first one so you can get an idea of what it's about. Owing to a unique mix of architectural influences and the fact that it held the the status of the largest city in Canada before the post-war suburban development boom, Montreal is among the best cities in North America for so-called missing middle housing. This refers to housing that's not as tall as high-rise towers, but also not as spread out as detached homes. And it includes residential styles like duplexes, triplexes, row houses, and low-rise apartment buildings that are lacking in a lot of North American cities, especially ones that really grew after World War II and applied a regime of restrictive suburban-style rules and regulations against density. This middle ground of housing is interesting because, if implemented properly, it can balance advantages of lower density living, like personal space and independence, with advantages of higher densities, like allowing more housing to be built and supporting more walkable and sustainable neighborhoods where people can live closer to the Whoops. the things they need, like schools, stores, parks, jobs, and bike shops. We've already covered the livability features of Montreal's housing in other videos. So in this video, we're going to dive deeper into population density, profiling five Montreal neighborhoods that achieve much more density than typical North American suburban development while staying on a low-rise scale. We're going to start with the neighborhood of Point St. Charles, situated to the southwest of downtown, an early industrial center of the city due to train yards, factories, and the nearby Lachine Canal. This district is arguably the origin of the low-rise stacked apartments that define so much of Montreal. Early versions of this distinctly Montreal housing started to be built in this neighborhood in the 1850s, and they were two floors at first, with three floor buildings starting to show up a few decades later. Although a majority of these buildings have two or more units across separate floors, some are actually just single-family attached homes, 
whether they were originally built like that or they were converted more recently from something like a duplex. Point St. Charles has a population density in residential blocks of around 15,000 people per square kilometer, roughly five times denser than a block of single-family homes in a suburban area of Montreal, where you typically find a density of about 3,000 people per square kilometer. That's a lot of density to achieve mostly through two- and three-story buildings, and it's our first example of how denser urban living doesn't have to mean towers. A lot of this density comes just from avoiding particularly space-intensive suburban features like prominent front lawns and space between houses. Most buildings here are attached to the side, while on the front they either come right to the street or have modest setbacks of one or two meters. What you don't necessarily notice from the street though is that nearly every building has a backyard, many of them with swimming pools. These buildings weren't planned around swimming pools. Originally the backyards were used for wells, laundry facilities, and coal storage, but the prioritization of backyards over front lawns is still really intriguing for modern day uses, because arguably backyards are more functional. Even when people have large suburban front yards, that's typically not where they choose to put their sheds, pools, barbecues, swing sets, or other things they spend time using. Often when people have prominent front yards, the most time they spend there is mowing the grass. Be honest, did you even use the front yard when playing The Sims? Our next neighborhood for Montreal's not so missing. Okay, so that, that video really kind of captures um, the difference of a city where, where you uh, increase that mixing middle or mixed middle housing, uh, where you have more housing options available, and it makes it a much, much more efficient system to run as well uh, than this sort of standard single family dwellings uh, that we're used to in most cities. So why is it that most cities are resistant to address climate change? You know, Alex gave us a little bit of an introduction uh, at the beginning. And, you know, when you, when you talk to different uh, people from different cities and stuff like that, the most common response we get is, why, you know, why don't we address climate change? It's usually because we have this perception that we can't afford to do it. Uh, budgets are stretched thin in municipalities. They have lots of different special interest groups that are pulling them in different directions. And it's easier just to say, well, honestly, we can't really afford to address this. But the reality is that our current pattern of development is far more costly than that compact design we were just talking about. If we did more of this, if we really focused on the land use planning component of it, we would save a ton of cash in capital costs and for, uh, for in infrastructure and operation costs delivering those services to sort of the far flung edges of the community as we develop. Um, more often than not, the math no matter or no longer matters. Uh, we're kind of stuck in a rut and we've accepted this status quo the way we develop. Um, however, the dollars saved through smarter development could be directed to programs that address climate change and spur on the green economy, which is really what we want to see happen. had to put this up. The reality is that we have the data to prove what types of developments are revenue positive, but far too often we just choose to ignore the math. As the problem gets bigger and bigger, we just decide not to look at it any longer. So this next little video, this is actually a, a Strong Towns video, and it's very pertinent for the city of North Bay because the, the current um, uh, council and mayor really took on this, this uh, session as, as a growth session for the city of North Bay and everything is about growth. But this video really talks about the difference between growth and productive growth. Uh, and productive growth is what can add wealth to a community and it allows them to afford even more actions that can make their city more sustainable. Uh, and this kind of delves into how do we go about knowing the difference between growth and productive growth. Whoops. Whenever America finds itself pinching pennies and fraying at the edges, what do people say we need? Growth, right? We are obsessed with it. But growth is clearly not enough. People get that which is why they know there's something undesirable about more gas stations and strip malls next door. If all of this growth was so great, why do people insist that it not be in their backyard? The biggest problem we face in this country is not a lack of growth. What we lack is productive growth, growth that actually builds our wealth over time. Productive growth makes a place 
better with age. It's full of cycles, endings, and beginnings, rather than being a linear journey toward decline. Productive growth is deceptively modest, like a food truck that matures into a full restaurant, or a row of young trees that mature into giant natural air conditioners. We know how to do this. It's part of our DNA as city builders. You too, I'm serious. Look at this street. What would you do to make this more lovable, more valuable? I have yet to meet a person who can't easily rhyme off a list of great ideas. Benches, fresh paint, add another story, street trees. There are hundreds of little improvements to be made here. What about this picture? Not as easy, is it? This kind of development is designed to decline. It's tough to make this more valuable without tearing it all out first. So let's extrapolate on that idea. Imagine trying to build a city that would age well over 200 years. One that would mature and grow stronger, not deteriorate fast and furious. Would it look more like this? Or this? The traditional style of development, financially, has enormous upside potential and very limited downside potential. While our new experimental style of building has a very limited financial upside with a downside that can literally go negative when the properties predictably go bad. The challenge of the next generation is gonna be, how do we go back and make really productive use of all the stuff that we've built? Building a strong town is a bit like throwing a good party. Everyone should show up at the door with something great to offer, whether it's food, drink, music, or conversation. The more, the merrier. We can think about cities the same way. New developments really can bring new life to the party. But like any decent guest, we should expect them to be good neighbors and to have the potential to add to the quality of their surroundings. And the beautiful thing is, it's not just about money. You can be a great neighbor by caring about your community. Because we protect, improve, and beautify the places that we love. Productive growth is greater than the sum of its parts. It's the magic that happens when we all improvise in harmony. So that, that was a really nice, succinct way of explaining the difference between growth, just growth and productive growth. And we really need to understand that concept at the uh, city level that, all not, that not all growth is, con is considered equal. Uh, and it's productive growth that really builds wealth. And that's what we should really be chasing after. Okay, so because our current city's mandate is growth, it's not clearly defined whether it's productive growth or not. Um, and we often have you know, statistics celebrating revenues generated from uh, building permits, of a, a new subdivision on the edge of town. And that's really mas just merely masking the financial reality of what we're doing. The reality is that the long-term costs of operating and maintaining infrastructure uh, of new residential developments on the outskirts uh, actually is a liability and not an asset to the city in many cases. Um, I like this quote just because growth for the sake of growth is the ideology of a cancer cell and eventually it takes the host and that's where a lot of cities are headed um, if, if they don't pay attention to this. This next little video clip is actually produced by Urban3, which is, I apologize, some of this is from the US. Um, however, the systems are exactly the same here in Canada. Um, the cities have the same patterns. Um, and this particular video, uh, the, the people from Urban 3 dig really deeper into how to identify the areas within the city that actually provide and build that wealth in the community. And it's not always obvious. Uh, you know, people are often shocked to learn that the shiny new big box stores um, developments that we see in town actually contributes less than a third of the tax revenues than the same area of sort of that shabby neglected downtown uh, area does. Um, just a sec here. So um, I guess some of the newest commercial de developments in North Bay, and these are actual North Bay numbers, right now they contribute land tax revenues at a rate of about $12 per square meter. While those neglected storefronts down in the downtown that we've all seen consistently generate revenues of about $30 per square meter. So nearly three times what those new developments are. So the potential returns of investing in a dense downtown, downtown is phenomenal uh, and will easily outperform nearly every style of commercial development that we're seeing today. So this next little video 
kind of digs a little deeper and we'll show it visually what, what, what we're talking about here. I'm Joe Minicozzi, and I'm the director of Urban 3 based in Asheville, North Carolina. We help cities look at land use, urban design, and economics so they can see how they're doing financially and what they can be doing better. What we consistently find is that municipalities and their counties perform better when they invest their dollars in walkable mixed-use development patterns instead of other forms of development like sprawl. Think of a company that consumes raw materials, adds some labor and know-how, and creates a product. This company will need to know the cost of their materials, their labor, revenue, and the ultimate market value of the product in order to see whether they will be successful or not. Cities are actually quite similar. Their raw material is a finite resource, the land within their borders, and their product is their tax base, which is what they need to survive and prosper. We have looked at cities all over the country, and when you do the math, it's easy to see that dense downtown development returns a greater investment to the community than putting tax dollars towards sprawl. Let's look at some examples. My house sits on one-tenth of an acre lot. Our municipal property taxes are about $1,100 a year, or about $11,000 an acre. This big box retailer sits on a 34-acre lot. Its total property taxes are a whopping $221,000 a year, which equates to about $6,500 an acre net to the city. Taking the city's portion of property taxes and adding the estimated retail taxes, it equals $54,000 in total tax production per acre. That seems like a lot until we compare it to a building downtown. This boarded up department store was converted into a mixed use building site that includes retail, office, and residential space. So where does this mixed use building come in? The city nets a considerable $330,000 in property taxes per acre. Add to it the estimated 83,000 in retail taxes per acre, which brings the total to the city to 413,000 per acre. That's more than seven and a half times the productivity of the big box site. Even looking at jobs, the big box store produces about six jobs per acre, while our mixed use building comes in at 74 jobs per acre. And let's not forget the downtown building also contains 90 residential units per acre. Those residents are working and shopping and creating additional economic activity. The big box store has zero residential units. But remember, most companies need to count more than raw material costs. They also need to account for their labor, management, and know-how. This is the investment they make in turning raw materials into finished product. Cities are the same. In order to turn land into tax base, they have to add a special something called infrastructure. At a minimum, cities add value to their land by providing streets, utility service, police protection, and fire protection. The more spread out a city becomes, the more expensive it is to deliver those services, especially when that acre of land pays less per acre. Unfortunately, when cities consider new developments, too often, they focus on taxes that they hope will flow to the city coffers without adequately considering the land base they will use up or the costs they will incur. In city after city, big and small, when we do the math, it's clear that dense downtown development is much more productive than anything else in the community. Downtown development is the golden goose of urban economics and is the best bet for cities that want to prosper in the long run. So that last little segment, you saw those graphics there um, showing little spikes. That's like a 3D model of the, the uh, land property revenues per area over different cities. And you can clearly see those tall, tall spikes on those maps are all coming from the downtown core of those cities. And that pattern repeats itself over and over and over and over again. Um, so it's really important to understand that we definitely need all different types of developments. We need the suburban development. We need some of those big box type stores or whatever, but really the economic engine of most cities still comes from those downtown stores. And if we neglect that area of our city, we're really, really missing out on some huge revenues. So I wanted to talk about this because maybe this analogy will make it a little simpler to understand, but running a city is a lot like running a farm. It's very, very similar. You know, a city like a farm has a finite land base and the revenues generated from that farm 
has to cover the cost of operations in order for it to be profitable. And making the most productive use of that land is paramount to being a successful farmer. And a bigger farm is not always the best farm, uh, as we'll see. So <laughs> this is Tom the farmer. Um, he just bought this farm that has 70 hectares, a very productive fertile land on either side of Cashflow Creek. And on, uh, he has also another uh, 30 hectares of forested land up on the ridge. And in the first few years that he has this defer, diversified crop, um, he does extremely, extremely well, uh, yielding close to $10,000 per, per hectare, sorry. Um, and his crops of onions, parsnips, carrots, broccoli, all real high, high yield crops. And Tom and his family are doing really, really well. I want you to think of these productive lands that are around the creek, much like the downtown in a city. So in fact, Tom did so well that his revenues far exceeded his costs in the first few years. Tom had considerable disposable income at, uh, that he could use. So he went out and spent his profits on some family trips. Um, he bought a new truck and put an addition on his house and Tom became an icon in his community. Um, so now I want you to think, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but these fertile fields that are on either side of the river are really the economic engine for his farm, very much the same way that the downtown, downtown is an economic engine uh, for a city. And these productive fields are generating $10,000 per hectare. Few years down the road, the fences in one of his fields need some repair, and the drainage tiles in one of his most productive fields get clogged and starts to flood. He loses about 10 hectares of his parsnip field at a cost of about $100,000 a year. But Tom is still really enjoying his lifestyle, and he's still turning in a pretty good profit. So Tom and his family decide to buy a, a vacation home in Hawaii for the family. His neighbors become really envious of Tom's success. So you can see what's happening here. He's had some degradation go on in his most productive fields. The fence has gone down, but he hasn't bothered to fix any of it because he's still doing relatively well. So let's not worry about it. So rather than address the problems in his most productive field, Tom starts to look at that forested ridge that he also owns. That's 30 hectares of land that's not under any kind of cultivation and not growing any crops for him. So Tom decides, I'm gonna borrow some money from the bank because he spent all his profits on the vacation home in Hawaii and he needs some extra capital to clear the trees. Uh, so he's gotta build some more fences. He's gotta install irrigation. He's gotta install drainage infrastructure. And he also has to build his road right over top of his productive field to get to uh, his new field. Think of this very much like how we build at the outskirts of towns in those big box developments, commercial developments and large suburban residential ones as well. So he's doing this because in his mind, he's gonna increase his farm productivity area by 30 hectares and hoping that it'll also bring him $10,000 per hectare, just like his original farm did provided. But the infertile land that's up on the ridge and because he can't grow high value cash crops on that, he ends up having to plant cattle corn, which only has a potential, potential value of $2,500 per hectare, one quarter of his original fields. So you have to think of this in terms of that dense downtown compared to the big box commercial stores at the edge of town like we were talking about earlier. Well, things didn't go as planned for Tom. He neglected his productive fields and they continued to deteriorate as more fences collapsed and the livestock got in the fields and weakened the bank on Cashflow Creek and part of his fields eroded into the creek and things weren't much better on his new fields either. Um, the soil was a lot drier, much less fertile than the original fields were. And they were only, like I said, they were only suitable for cattle corn at 2,500 per hectare. But to make matters worse, he had to borrow more money for fertilizer and irrigation and new equipment to handle the new crop, which he didn't have before. So now his profits and yield from those areas has, had diminished to $1,500 per acre. So you've got to think of this as the deterioration of these big box stores. And for anybody that's you know, familiar with North Bay, um, I think all of us are seeing things like the North Bay Mall and even Northgate Square to some extent as they become more and more vacant and decline in value, their tax value also go down. Don't, don't be fooled into thinking that they're paying 
the same amount of property taxes that they did when they first opened up. As they become more and more vacant, they start paying less and less tax, but they still occupy that same big area in the city of valuable land. So what happens? Well, Tom's in dire straits now because he's uh, short on cash and not producing nearly as much as he had before. So he has to sell his vacation home in Hawaii at a loss. And that new truck that he bought a few years back is just about at the end of its useful life, but he doesn't have any money for a new one anymore. And Cashflow Creek cannot provide enough water to irrigate his new fields. So they just turn to blow sand and weeds. And his old productive fields that he's neglected over the years have grown up in shrubs and he can no longer even cultivate those. So Tom had chased after the growth for the sake of growth and had forgotten what was productive growth. His neighbors are no longer envious of him and Tom's in big trouble. So what lessons did Tom learn? This seems really, really simple, but it's not. You need to know where your revenues come from. Uh, if you don't know where your real revenues are coming from, then you can't really manage a city very well. Um, you have to acknowledge and understand not all growth is productive growth. We need to maximize the revenues from the land base that you're managing because it is a finite space. And recognizing that ignoring the math will not make the problem go away. You know, Tom learned that lesson. I'm wondering if we will as well. So just to summarize this a little bit about how this relates to, to um, uh, climate actions, you know, sound land use planning and supporting small scale developers to constantly breathe, breathe life into downtown buildings makes good financial sense. And the downtown buildings are adaptable. Uh, they're small risk investments with high uh, potential rewards. And the dollars that are saved and generated through sound land use planning and development can be used to address climate change and kickstart a green economy. Uh, I hope this presentation has given you some insight on how good land use planning and supporting small scale developers can be a huge contributor to combating climate change and that a dense and vibrant downtown is the economic engine of every city and it creates the opportunity to affect positive change. And I'd be willing to field any of your questions at this time. That was really great, Rod. Thank you. Um, as a, well, I, Northern Ontario is my home, but I did go to McGill for my undergrad. So Montreal is a place close to my heart. So getting those little snippets of Montreal definitely rang true to me. And I can attest that I didn't know it was called missing middle housing. I actually, I learned that I learned a new word today, or I guess it's not a word. It's a, you know, a concept. Uh, and I guess, yeah, I mean, it's true. I recognize that that contrast between, you know, what I know to be Northern Ontario and North Bay and in Sudbury, and then in comparison to uh, the city of Montreal, it's very different. Um, and I didn't know it was called that. That's great. Um, I, I, I would, I have plenty of questions again, um, but again, if some anybody has other burning questions they'd like to kick us off with, I'd be happy to let someone else uh, ask a question or two, um, if anyone has any. Same here, I've got plenty of questions too. Yeah. Like the audience to, you know, yeah, anything that trigger any ideas, uh, are you feeling inspired? How, how might this apply here in North Bay? Has anybody got any views they want to share? Feel free to say some words. No, we're a bit shy tonight. Okay, I'll we'll carry on. Question, Rod. Oh, I'll, I'll ask a question, Scott here. Uh, Rod, really good. You and I have talked about the, the stuff that you presented today before, uh, particularly surrounding the, you know, the property tax assessment in um, existing built up areas versus the fringes of town kind of thing, the Tom the Farmer story. Um, so, so if you're in a situation like it seems like North Bay is in where you have the development comes from the private sector, it comes from private landowners and developers, who appear to uh, behave that in the way that they, they prefer their chances with those other kinds of developments, the big buildings on the edges of town and green fields and, and undeveloped areas seems to be uh, feeling, and I don't know, maybe you disagree with this, but it seems to be a feeling that the return on investments are much higher and it's a much safer play for them for that capital to move to those types of projects. As a city, um, you know, I guess it's the planning department, but what, what do we do 
to try to um, change the habits of the private sector. Yeah, it's a it's a really good point, and it's and it's uh, you're absolutely right. Um, developers aren't stupid; they they do know where they make their best profits from, and they will use whatever policies that are uh, implemented within a, a particular municipality to their best advantage. And it's not a it's not a criticism of them at all. Uh, they're in it to make to make money, so we should expect them to do the thing that makes them the most profit. The problem is that we often, as city managers and planners, are trying to achieve a certain goal, but the policies and so on that we put in place don't actually lead us to the to the goal line. Uh, they actually lead us to a different area. And essentially, what's happening when we have developers developing on the edge of town? For the most part, we are subsidizing those developments, and that's why they're very beneficial for the developer, developer to develop there. Um, whereas when they try to do infill uh, developments in within the city, it's generally more expensive, more complicated for them to do, uh, more issues with uh, zoning requirements and restrictions and stuff like that. So you're essentially pushing them to the outskirts to develop because it's cheaper, more profitable, and easier for them to do. So the problem really starts within the city itself in designing their policies and, and their official plans to encourage the type of development that they want to see happen. Um, I hope that kind of answers your question, Scott. Thanks, Rod. Yeah, no, I, I see it the same way, right? It's a planning, official plan, planning department, this, the small incentive programs, little charities that we offer to people just have to be targeted in the right area. Thanks. Yeah, and, I, and I'm, not, I'm definitely not picking on North Bay because this is not a North Bay problem. Right. This is a municipal problem across all of Canada, not just North Bay. No um, offense it, taken. It's all good. Yeah, no, and it and it doesn't. It does take time to respond to it too because you make some policy changes. And I know that the city of North Bay has made some really good policy changes. And it takes time to see how developers respond to those before you can, you know, adjust again. So I'm not. I'm not being. I'm not being critical of them because we're all in the same boat. I see uh, Brene has, uh, you have your question, your hand up there if you wanna go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, that was a great presentation, Rod. And uh, I thought I had two questions, but after Rod's answer to Scott's question, I have three, but I'll ask one at a time and then go back. So I think my, okay. my, my first question is around um, development charges. And uh, I'm also not gonna be critical of North Bay. Um, in particular, it's just that all the examples I know are North Bay, and that's the community that I'm most interested in. Um, and I'm wondering, Rod, what you think about, uh, you know, uh, most will probably be aware that the city suspended development charges. I think it was maybe two years ago, I've lost track of time, but just both generally, and I guess maybe specifically, what do you see as the, the potential for using development charges, both their application and sort of, uh, um, uh, making them graduated or having criteria, close criteria. What do you see as the potential for using development charges to drive more sustainable, more climate friendly kind of development? Yeah, I, I may not be the most qualified person to talk about development charges just because there's a, a lot of restrictions surrounding them on how they can be applied and so on. And I did sit in on some of the development meetings with the city of North Bay when we were talking about this. Um, and I think the general feeling was that they would implemented development charges for a long period of time uh, to provide funds for the infrastructure for some of the newer areas that are being developed currently in North Bay, which includes sort of up by the college and university and out towards uh, Nipissing Junction. Um, the general feeling was that the development charges that they had collected to date had been sufficient to provide the infrastructure for that development uh, to occur over the next whatever it's going to be 10 to 15 years to fill up those areas and i think the developers in general had applied a fair bit of pressure saying what are we paying for you've already put all the infrastructure in why should we continue to pay for this let us develop at a reduced cost so that we can start putting some stuff in place um, part of the issue i think Renee, really is when you go back to uh, municipal affairs and housing and they're really really restrictive on how municipalities can uh, charge uh, uh, property taxes, how they can apply development charges. So they have a very, very narrow, I guess, avenue to work within. So it makes it very difficult to do. 
but probably there, you know, one of the planners would be able to answer those questions better for you uh, when it comes to development charges, but they are pretty restrictive on where you can apply them. Hmm. So Simon, if you don't mind, I'll just go to my third question because it follows Please. from that. This is oh, what we want. <laughs> Interested what in your comments, and it resonated with me, your comments that, um, you know, all residents are subsidizing sprawl development. And I don't, um, I don't have any sense of how to calculate levels of subsidy. Um, but I have, you know, I sort of intuit that certain developments push us over an edge that then can cause a major infrastructure requirement, whether it's a, you know, um, a major, anyway, I won't, I won't, I won't use the example that came to mind, but um, so is there, have you come across, a, a, I mean, is there a methodology for um, calculating both levels of like fiscal, because we're subsidizing, I think in two ways, we're subsidizing, there's a fiscal subsidy, we're actually, all residents are pitching in to pay for new infrastructure, but also we're subsidizing environmentally that as a community, we lose certain environmental assets or an environmental services. So do you know, is, have you come across any methodology for uh, how to, I guess, you know, best case, how to calculate, but even how to actually grapple with those issues, how to be able to, um, uh, apply them to a certain development. So when we're debating a development, I at present don't have the language to be able to really get at those issues that I intuit are there, um, but I don't have the methodology or language to really get at them, at least, <laughs> at least so far not in a way that convinces council. <laughs> yeah, so I, I guess to answer your question, for the environmental part, that's a really a bit of an intangible one. It's a really difficult one to transfer those values that come from the environment. And I mean, I've worked in it in 40, for 40 years, but taking those values and then turning it into a monetary or monetizing it somehow that you can put into an equation, that's a tough one. But the straight financial part of it is not a tough one. We have all of that data. And you know, I mentioned in the presentation there by Urban 3, that three-dimensional mod modeling. I just wanna spend a second to explain how that works because it's really quite interesting. So what they do is they basically go on an area basis, block by block, and they take a look at the property taxes that come from those buildings per square meter or hectare or, or acre, whatever area measurement you want to use, and generate a graph showing whether what the positive input is of property taxes. Then they look at that very same property and they total up the cost of all the infrastructure that goes to serving that piece of property which includes you know, the operation, the maintenance, the replacement of those things, because they don't last forever, uh, the roads, the fire, the, all of those services that we take for granted. And then you, you can figure out, is this a positive transaction when we develop in this neighborhood or is that a negative one? And when you see it visually in a 3D model, anybody, I don't care what skill level you're at, you can very quickly tell where you should be developing and where you should not be developing or where you should be charging for development far more than we are because we're losing in every single one of those transactions. Um, and I think, you know, again, part of the issue is we work in a, in a society where we have uh, political uh, um, elections every four years. So often, and I'm not saying that they don't have good intentions, but literally they're there for four years. So to make a hard decision is difficult to do uh, when they know they're going to be up for a re-election in four years' time. Um, so it's not an easy, easy one to make. Um, and sometimes getting that little blip of development in that four-year time can pay for some of the expenses that they incurred 20 years ago that we're still worrying about. I took a look at the City of Sudbury's road network. The average life of a road in the city of Sud Sudbury is somewhere between 15 and 20 years. At the current tax level that they're charging their citizens right now, those roads have to last 86 years. So it's pretty clear that sooner or later that system's going to crumble and they're gonna have to stop servicing some of those roads. And they're probably gonna stop servicing the ones on the outskirts and constrict back into where they can afford to 
to manage it. And that might be nothing more than we're not paving this road anymore. It's going to become a gravel road um, or we're only going to, you know, it's a secondary snowplow route or whatever the case may be. Um, but that's not unique to Sudbury. Sudbury has a lot of roads, but all northern towns, all cities in, in Ontario are in the exact same case. If you look at their asset management, you can clearly see they don't have the funds to uh, replace the infrastructure that they've built over these years. And you know, I, I struggled with wondering how is it that North Bay has built so many new roads, so many new houses, and yet for the last 40 years, our population has been completely flat. Like, why did we need all this extra infrastructure? Um, and part of it is really just the change in the household dynamics in, in Canada. Uh, we used to have four or five people per household. We now have two or less. So we didn't gain new families. They basically just all live in smaller family units and, and uh, occupy much greater space than we used to uh, occupy before. Uh, I don't know if that answers your question a little bit, but from the financial standpoint, yes, we have the data, we have the numbers, we could do it like that. Yeah, great questions and answers so far. So I just want to look back a bit to some of the uh, content within the videos you played. I mean, uh, there was reference there to Jan Gell uh, over in uh, originally from Copenhagen, uh, Denmark, a world leader, really, when it comes to urban design, landscape architecture, good planning. And um, Rod, I just wondered if you had any more kind of, you know, comments about what you see as good urban design or interventions that we could put into certain little communities here in North Bay. How could we make some just subtle improvements that would not only get people moving in a more sustainable way, but improve everybody's uh, quality of life, let's say. Yeah, uh, I mean, even if we move beyond the downtown, because I think a lot of people know what sorts of things need to occur in a downtown, but we do have a lot of suburban development in all of our communities. And that's a struggle. Like, what do we do with this stuff now that we built it to make it better? Um, one of the things that we're seeing more and more often is, um, when we do get a big vacancy within, within a suburban area, that we don't just redevelop that back to single family homes again. We try to install or an, uh, the, that mixed use type of uh, building so that now the people that are in that surrounding suburban area have stores and services and stuff like that that are within their own neighborhood that they no longer have to drive to. I, I, one of the examples I'm thinking about in the North Bay is the old hospital site, which is kind of situated right in the middle of the Pinewood neighborhood. Pinewood neighborhood is like the classic um, suburban development in Canada where you have nothing but houses and, and streets. That's essentially all that's there. Um, that could have been a really nice, neat little package to redevelop with a mixed use uh, development uh, that would include some of the stores and services and stuff like that within walking distance of that entire neighborhood. But those are the sort of things you kind of have to look at. And I know uh, in Perry Sound, the old Perry Sound Mall, which is was essentially in about the same condition as the North Bay Mall, um, a, developer, a developer came in and changed about 30% of that mall into residential units for elderly people because they had no space uh, for elderly people. The demographics were aging in that area. Um, and it just seemed to make good sense because it, that, that property was a huge property not being used for anything productive at all. Um, and somebody saw the opportunity to change it into uh, residential units. So I think those types of things have to occur, with, but it takes some work to do those. Well, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up about the malls, actually, because, I mean, there's been a number of different studies taking uh, pilot projects taking place in, in the USA in particular to try and uh, reconfigure and reuse some of these vast malls that were already on the decline pre-COVID anyway because of this change in consumer habits and people uh, ordering more to the doorstep or supporting local, you know, <laughs> or a mix of the two. And, um, you know, they're looking at examples of building uh, mixed-use uh, residential blocks above these uh, shopping malls to create that critical mass of people to make some of those uh, businesses more viable, but also to uh, potentially, you know, it's brownfield development in the sense that you're not having to build further out onto the uh, peripheral uh, the sites, as you mentioned, and adding that further infrastructure burden. So um, have you seen many um, other examples of... I mean, even just taking the parking lots at malls, like the, you see now examples where they're building these frameworks and installing solar, so using it as an energy generation uh, spot. And how can we, you know, bust up some of the asphalt and, and create some nice like spaces, like uh, swales and tree planting and, and courtyards to actually make those spaces more inviting? Does that trigger any yeah. further insights? Or? <laughs> 
Um, definitely, that does occur. Um, there's there's lots of examples in the U.S. and probably because they did a lot more of that type of development than we did in Canada, and to a greater extent, um, and they're experiencing the problems a little sooner than we're seeing them happen here. So definitely, those types of things are happening. Um, and, and there's a million different uses for those those large properties, but they are large properties. So it you have to really almost come up with a comprehensive plan for that entire site because they are, you know, anywhere from five to 10 hectares in size, they're quite large. Um, but yeah, I mean, um, seniors homes is a huge one that is being is happening quite often. And they try to combine that with the services that seniors might want to use. So lots of medical related medical services, um, uh, exercise areas, so walking zones and stuff like that outdoor spaces that they can easily get to th from their, their units. That's a really popular conversion that is occurring in a lot of, a lot of spaces. And to me, can make an awful lot of sense uh, because we're really struggling to find um, homes and, and spaces for our, you know, our aging demographic. Um, Leanne, I see you have your hand up, but before I get to you, I'm just, uh, Kylie uh, put something in the chat saying that she really resonated with your point about human-centered design. Um, and was wondering if there were any local examples in North Bay that, you know, you can point to and you can say, yeah, we want more of this. Like, is there, what, what, what do we have? What are we doing right so far? Um, I think one of the things that for me is a really important uh, combination is recognizing uh, arts and culture in your community and what that can do for a community. Um, we have a number of outdoor art installations in North Bay. I took part in a couple of them myself, but there's been lots more interest in that type of thing. And, and I'll, I'll just give an example. And I, anybody that knows me has probably heard me talk about this one before, but the uh, city of Granby in Quebec um, has a walking trail in their city that goes around a small lake that's right in the center of the city. And the mayor was pretty forward thinking and he had a half a million dollars to do some sort of improvement to that trail but he didn't know what to do with it. And he didn't really want to make the decision. So they struck a committee of local citizens and said, here's a half a million dollars. You guys figure out what's a great idea. So they ended up doing was big art installations all the way along the trail at several locations. Um, and the intent was twofold really. One, it made it more beautiful, more interesting to, to walk. But at every one of those art installations, they also installed park benches because they knew people would congregate at those spots. And when people congregate at those spots, all of a sudden they talk to each other and they network and they start discovering, oh, what do you do? What do I do? Oh, maybe we should get together and do stuff. And they found out that this really spawned sort of the entrepreneurial spirit in their community and got people to know all, all different sectors of their community as well, because everybody uses that trail, not just the rich people, not just the poor people, but every, every uh, segment of the population. And it was a really good way of bringing them together. Something like that, I think, is a really important thing. And I think arts and culture are really a secret to that. I think that's a that's a great insight for sure. Um, I know we're I know we're running running out of time. So, uh, Leanne, I'll have you ask your your question. Go right ahead. Your last but not least, certainly not least. <laughs> I was actually just going to add to the conversation. Thanks for your presentation, Rod. Um, what we've seen as an opportunity in North Bay is using existing schools. Uh, so, the example I, I property manage our co working space at one seventy six Lakeshore which used to be the Tweedsmere Elementary School. And we've implemented a lot of things that you've talked about. So we've developed a courtyard, a co co-working concepts with regular tenants, uh, but those based on focus groups uh, that we did with the community before we even started this plan altogether. So um, I think there's lots more that we can do with existing buildings, even outside of the downtown core, because as we know, North Bay is spread out and we want to bring life to all the communities, um, especially those who aren't necessarily walking distance from the core. So I just wanted to add that's another uh, thing we've seen as a really um, new way of framing how we can use existing space for the community. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. Yeah, and you're right, you know, West Ferris in, in North Bay is really ripe for the picking for this type of development. 
because we have all kinds of little holes within uh, West Ferris right now that uh, are vacant lands. And some of them are really valuable vacant lands like waterfront lands that are just sitting there doing nothing and they've been doing nothing for years. Um, it's a shame because West Ferris is really suffering and you know your project at 176 is a really good example of the, the ways that we can redevelop uh, properties and make them beneficial and valuable to the community. And we do need to see a lot more of that kind of development. You're right. Yeah, I just want to second that and say it's an absolute excellent example is 176 Lakeshore and it's um, so flexible and versatile for events and for, you know, meetings and for people that have their businesses permanently stationed there and it's wonderful work that they're doing. Um, just last comment kind of about the Lakeshore uh, Drive kind of area. When I came, I was a little bit disillusioned with it because I was told oh, I'm going to go down Lakeshore Drive. So I was like assuming something like, know Miami or a boulevard or something like that and it kind of got me you know when you see all the parking lots and the concrete and stuff I was like um so you know I'm wondering you know could we rename it Lakeshore Boulevard could we really look at an urban design strategy for that stretch of road and see um I know there's been some environmental impact assess work, assessment work going on I don't know if it includes tree planting landscaped areas to try and uh naturalize it a little bit more Rod do you want to offer any more insights on that or yeah, I, I actually did think about West Fairs quite a bit. Um, and, you know, some of the things that could possibly work is like a, a asset based community development where you take a look at the people and the resources that are within the area that you're trying to plan for. Uh, instead of looking for external sources, you look at the strengths that you have within that community and bring those ideas together. And I think West Ferris, like I said, it, it's it, it's kind of a linear community because Lakeshore was sort of the spine to all the businesses and having the lake on one side and the residential on the other side. Um, I think it has a potential for doing something like that, like a community-based plan that's specific to West Ferris because they are, it's quite different than most of the other development uh, and the land use in the rest of the city because it is so linear in nature and it's kind of constricted. You've got the lake on one side and the railroad on the other and everything's in a long strip between the two pieces. Um, but by the same token, like I said, it's got some really, really valuable assets that are not being used to the best potential here right now. And I think we could probably get better results from the community that lives there and the businesses that operate there than waiting for something to happen through some sort of government interve intervention. That was awesome. Great job, everybody. Great discussion. I barely had to moderate. I didn't have to say anything. Well done, everyone. Round of applause. Um, I'm going to share. I'm just going to do a final little screen share here. Um, and thank you all for attending. Um, I hope that you'll join us again for our next presentation starting at the same time next week, 6.30 p.m. on Thursday, February 3rd, uh, to hear from Brene Lloyd, uh, another local champion who will be discussing a newly launched project which seeks to evaluate sustainable and social transportation options here in North Bay, which I think is gonna complement some of the things that we said today really well. Um, it's another one you won't want to miss. So uh, remember to register in advance on Eventbrite. I put the link in the chat. Uh, you'll also find it on our Facebook page and our Twitter if, if you are ever like, hmm, where did I put that link? Uh, so we'll see you then. Thank you everybody and have a great night. Bye, everybody.